the Trump increase, just the increase, is larger than the um, entire military budgets of European powers like France, Germany, United Kingdom. It's only $12 billion less than the entire Russian military budget. So I, th I think it's been very much understated in the press just what a huge increase this is. As it mentions on the slide, it's more than the next eight countries in the world combined. Uh, and it's going to come almost dollar for dollar from uh, cuts in education, environment, uh, health and human services, basically federal programs that serve uh, low income and working people. Um, so not only is it going to uh, promote war, but it's also going to risk lives at home uh, because of the kinds of programs that are being cut. Um, I think if we look at the slide number four, it'll show you the um, breakdown in the discretionary budget, which, um, you know, 54% of the discretionary budget, which is basically everything but things like Medicare and Medicaid, which are entitlements. You have to change the law to change those. These are things that Congress votes on every year. Uh, but as you'll see, it's most of the things people think of as government, transportation, energy, environment, housing, community development, veterans benefits, and so forth. So the entire federal government, other than transfer payments, is already dominated by the Pentagon. And the Trump uh, budget or the ones being considered in the Senate would make that even worse. It would be more than 54 cents, could be 60 cents on a dollar. So it's putting a huge squeeze on everything else the government uh, tries to do. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember that Trump isn't the only problem here. Uh, Congress is a huge problem, Democrats and Republicans both, because uh, there's very few members standing up and saying, this is too much. We can't be throwing this kind of money at the Pentagon. So part of what's needed is people to go after them in town hall meetings, meetings in the district, letters to the editor, any way possible to start generating some pressure on them so they know there's a political cost to them to signing off on this horrific, uh, I believe, obscene uh, budget. So, you know, the fact that you're on this webinar and that you're planning to do this work is essential. Um, it's not gonna happen in Washington alone. Washington is where there's kind of incremental change and everybody's looking at this, you know, little tweak at the subcommittee level and so forth. But if we really want to change the priorities of the country, uh, it's got to be people organizing at the grassroots all over the country. And that's why it's so important that Jackie's on to talk about some of the local initiatives uh, with the mayors. Um, so uh, to talk about the cost of war, uh, we could move to slide uh, yes, here's the one I was thinking of. Um, if you look at Iraq, which was one of the most disastrous wars in recent history, certainly, over a million civilian casualties, 4,400 U.S. service personnel, millions of people displaced. And depending how you measure it, if you measure just the straight taxpayer costs or the long-term costs of taking care of veterans and so forth, anywhere from $800 billion to $3 trillion. And it's important to remember that the um, Bush administration said, oh, this will cost 50 billion, you know, about 1 20th of what it ended up costing just in terms of tax money. So they, they always understate the cost of war on the way in, and then we pay it, uh, you know, once the war gets started. And of course, the wars of this century have not ended. Um, so, um, you know, if we let this, uh, continue to happen, there's going to be two sets of consequences. One is, of course, funding more war. And Trump has already increased uh, troop presence in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, and the Philippines, special forces, other kinds of boots on the ground, increased drone strikes, and so forth. So, um, you know, he, did, he inherited these wars from Obama. Obama was no peacenik. But he's ratcheting up yet another level. Uh, and he's put the generals in charge. So there's not even a discussion of how many troops in Afghanistan. He's just handing it off to General Mattis, saying, oh, you, you know, you decide. So it's even in some ways a more militarized government than we had uh, under Obama, which was already one of the more hawkish administrations in, of recent times. Um, you know, the one difference with Obama is that he 
fought more wars with fewer troops in more places. He didn't have 160,000 troops in Iraq like Bush did, or uh, he gradually wound down in Afghanistan after uh, jacking up the numbers. So he's tried what I call politically sustainable warfare, what they think they can get away with. If there's fewer U.S. troops, if it's more drone strikes, more military aid, more training, um, they think there'll be less uh, domestic attention to it. Uh, and I think that's going to change, but I, I think they've had some success with that in terms of the average person not thinking about the costs of war. Uh, and I think it's our job to help change that. Um, so if you look at slide 11, and the ones in between are sort of the consequences, uh, it's, it goes into more detail on Iraq and Afghanistan, just the huge uh, consequences of this war and, and the continuing costs of the war against ISIS, the war in Afghanistan, and so forth. So um, these are just kind of the costs of war itself, the actual fighting of the wars. But the Pentagon gets hundreds of billions more to build a new generation of nuclear weapons, to do peacetime training. Uh, they've got programs to give aid to local police forces. So they actually spend more money on bureaucracy and preparing for war than they even spend on these wars themselves, which are horrifically expensive. So, um, of course, the war is being brought home uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, Trump wants to cut environmental protection by 31%, which is unprecedented. Uh, he wants to cut the Labor Department by 20%. So uh, people's wages are getting stolen. Nobody's going to protect them. Occupational safety and health is going to be abandoned. Um, things that matter to the workforce are going to be unattended to by the federal government. Um, housing is being cut 13%, low-income housing, which was already hugely gutted going back to the Reagan years. Uh, so it's already on life support, and they're cutting it further. Um, and the kinds of impacts we're seeing, um, they want to cut the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, which is more commonly known as food stamps, uh, $190 billion over 10 years. And that'll tip at least 5 million people into poverty and many millions more will go hungry. Uh, so if you compare that to the plan to spend a trillion dollars on a new generation of nuclear weapons over three decades, which is making the world a more dangerous place and could end life as we know it, I think it's pretty clear how skewed the priorities are. Um, they're gonna get rid of six block grants that serve low-income communities. They're worth about 13 billion, the six of them together. And they give job training, mental health services, home heating, substance abuse treatment, child care. And all those block grants together cost about the same as the new aircraft carrier uh, that the Navy's buying. And they have 12 of those. So um, again, unless you think we need to be patrolling every corner of the globe looking for new wars to fight, when we already have seven underway, that kind of spending priority makes no sense. Um, and they also want to cut Medicaid by hundreds of billions of dollars in the next 10 years, knocking at least 14 million people off of health insurance. And they're going to try to do this whatever way possible. If they can do it through a health care bill, they'll do that. If they can come at it in a different way, they'll do that. But they're going to be relentless about going after um, health care for low-income people and middle-income people. A lot of people depend on Medicaid now, given how messed up the um, health care system is. And I think it's important to keep in mind, these programs weren't meeting the needs out there to begin with. There are many unmet needs under existing funding. And so this is going to take a very difficult situation for many, many people and make it that much worse. And I think, you know, the, I think the thing we want to think about is we're not talking about going back to the good old days before November 9th. Uh, we want to build a better world. And that means better than Obama, better than Clinton, certainly better than Trump, better than most leaders in Congress are willing to even contemplate. So we're fighting defensive battle, but hopefully we're also raising hopes for a, a better future, which I think is one way to inspire people to activism. Um, so my last point is, you know, just what we can expect in Congress. Um, there's going to be votes this week. Uh, on the floor on the House Appropriations Bill for Defense. 
And these things happen very quickly. So there's groups like Peace Action and others who will send out alerts, Women Without War, uh, Women's Action for New Directions. And they'll mention three or four things you might want to weigh in on. For example, there's some amendments to try to restrain U.S. support for the Saudi war in Yemen. Uh, Barbara Lee's got an amendment to try to change the authorization for the use of military force, which was what they used after 911 to basically create a blank check for war. So she's trying to rein that in. Um, so those things are short term, but I think you know the big fight is going to be now through the fall and probably into December about how much the Pentagon is going to get. Uh, and all these numbers, Trump's numbers, the Armed Services Committee numbers, Appropriations Committee numbers, are just suggestions. There's no, none of them are set in stone. So the more pressure we put on, uh, the better we're going to see the possible results, at least claw some of that money back from the Pentagon. And there's probably three possibilities. One is there's budget caps on the Pentagon going back about five years, but they're only on its main regular budget, not on the war budget. So what they've been doing is they have to stay under caps for the Pentagon. They throw tens of billions of dollars into the war budget for all kinds of pet projects that aren't even being used in the wars, but are things that couldn't fit in the regular Pentagon budget. So they're either going to make a deal to eliminate those caps, and then all bets are off on how much they can spend on the regular budget or the war budget, or they're not going to be able to lift the caps then they'll jack up the war budget as high as they can get away with. Um, or they'll be a complete train wreck, which actually for us would be the best possibility because then if they don't pass the budget, they have to stick to last year's levels. So at least these increases they're pushing for now would be held off. So uh, none of those are the outcomes that we want, but I, I think what we wanna do is put as much pressure as possible on the process to get the lowest level depending on spending and to educate as many people as possible to keep the heat on their members of Congress. Because uh, it's rare to even hear one of them get on the floor uh, and say, this is insane. You know, why are we spending this kind of money when we're basically uh, taking food, medical care, housing away from people who need it in order to spend on weapons we don't need and to fight wars we shouldn't be involved in. Um, so that's, those are the basic points I have, and you're in good hands with Code Pink in terms of activism, uh, because Code Pink works all aspects of the problem and is one of the most forceful, and I think most present groups in fighting on these issues. So uh, thanks for having me, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Bill. It's, it's great to, um, to learn from you. Thank you so much for, for being here, for all your knowledge and the work you do as well. Um, and as Bill, is saying there's so much impact from all the money that is funneling to, to war and wars and uh, more violence. And um, we can be different and we can, we should be creating spaces in our communities to be more educated about what's happening and uh, imagining what we can do with, with all that money and we should, and what should we be um, investing in. So um, now I'm going to pass it to Jackie Cavazzo um, to talk more about some of the victories in trying to divest from war and also the importance of um, local organizing. Let me see, Jackie. Um, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. If not, I'll try to do it from here. Oh, how about oh, now? You can you hear me? Yes. I All right. So I thank you, Mariana and Ariel and Code Pink for inviting me to be part of this webinar. So I'm going to jump right into it. I want to start with a little bit of historical context, um, because the, the idea of um, city based local organizing is not new. In the 1980s, there were lots of organizing initiatives, including anti apartheid divestment campaigns at the city level. There were local nuclear weapon free zones. Altogether, over 130 U.S. cities being coordinated by Nuclear Free America. But a cautionary note, because this is what we're going to keep running into, mostly those were symbolic and declaratory, but with financial implications sometimes causing cities to violate their own ordinances in order to purchase from or invest in companies and financial institutions that are part of the web of nuclear weapons makers, uh, the military-industrial complex. 
comes back to bite us again and again. Um, there was even a magazine called Municipal Diplomacy. And of course, in the early 2000s, as part of the anti-Iraq war campaign, there were cities for peace. So now we're operating in a new context, which I think is best summed up in an article I just came across called States and Cities Saying No to the Feds uh, by Kirk Kirkpatrick Sale, in which he describes a growing trend towards what he calls nullification of federal laws and policies by cities and states. So it seems that in a time when the federal government and Congress are increasingly dysfunctional and unresponsive to the needs of people, there's a tremendous opportunity as well as a need to organize and build grassroots power at the local level. So the most striking uh, example of this is the mayor's response to the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, in response to President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. On June 1st, they issued a statement, quote, as 362 U.S. mayors representing 66 million Americans, we will adopt, honor, and uphold the commitments to the goals enshrined in the Paris Agreement. We will intensify efforts to meet each of our city's current climate goals, push for new action to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, and work together to create a 21st century clean energy economy. Now other examples are sanctuary cities, minimum wage laws, marijuana laws, gun laws, healthcare, and there are other examples. So why not tackle federal spending priorities and nuclear disarmament advocacy at the local level? Just the way the mayors responded to the current administration pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, we need to respond to the other existential threat, that's the threat of nuclear weapons, as well as bloated military spending. Of course, it's easier for cities to engage in direct action to mitigate climate change, so we need to be creative. We have to remember that there are thousands of military bases in the United States, uh, which have economic ties to local communities, as well as military contractors everywhere. So this idea of just transition that was mentioned earlier also needs to be in our thinking. Uh, but this year, resolutions have been adopted by cities, including uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Charlottesville, Virginia, Evanston, Illinois, New London, New Hampshire, and West Hollywood, California, urging Congress to cut military spending and redirect funding to meet human and environmental needs. So let me talk a little bit about Mayors for Peace now and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, I serve as the uh, North American Coordinator of Mayors for Peace, among my other hats. Um, Mayors for Peace was founded in 1982 at the conclusion of the United Nations Second Special Session on Disarmament by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. According to its covenant, it says, through close cooperation among cities, Mayors for Peace strives to raise international public awareness regarding the need to abolish nuclear weapons and contributes to the realization of genuine and lasting world peace by working to eliminate starvation and poverty assist refugees fleeing local conflict, support human rights, protect the environment, and solve the other problems that threaten peaceful coexistence within the human family. Mayors for Peace has grown to include 7,392 cities in 162 countries, representing more than 1 billion people, and there are 210 U.S. members. The current president of Mayors for Peace is the mayor of Hiroshima, the mayor of Nagasaki is the lead vice president with a total of 28 executive cities around the world. And Mayor Frank County of Des Moines, Iowa is the newest vice president and the lead U.S. mayor. So I'm going to get into these slides in just a minute, but let me tell you about the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The U.S. Conference of Mayors is the national nonpartisan association of America's cities with populations over 30,000. There are 1,408 such cities, and resolutions adopted at annual June meetings become official U.S. Conference of Mayors policy. Increasingly strong resolutions submitted by Mayors for Peace members have been adopted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors for 12 consecutive years now. So if you want to move to the next slide. So this June, June 26, the U.S. Conference of Mayors unanimously adopted a Mayors for Peace resolution entitled Calling on President Trump to Lower Nuclear Tensions, Prioritize Diplomacy, and Redirect Nuclear Weapons Spending to Meet Human Needs and Address Environmental Challenges. The conference also adopted two additional resolutions 
calling for reversal of military spending to meet the needs of cities. And the link that up here will take you to a press release which provides a lot of context and details as well as links to the text of all of the resolutions and the sponsors of the resolutions. In the case of the U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution, there were 20 co-sponsors. So I'd just like to take you through a few of the highlights of the resolution. Could I have the next slide, please? So th this, these are just some of the provisions of this resolution, which are talking about the, uh, no, could I back, please, which are talking about the really urgent, no, next one, <laughs> the really dire dangers we are facing, growing dangers uh, from nuclear weapons and the growing dangers of nuclear, of wars among nuclear armed powers. So it cites the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which has moved the hands of its doomsday clock to two and a half minutes to midnight, citing the twin existential threats posed by nuclear weapons and climate change. This is a very important quote here. Um, this is an unprecedented moment in human history. The world has never faced so many nuclear flashpoints simultaneously, from NATO-Russia relations to the Korean Peninsula, to South Asia and the South China Sea and Taiwan. All of the nuclear armed states are tangled up in conflicts and crises that could catastrophically escalate at any moment. And this is part and parcel of our anti-war work. Okay, next slide. So this gives us a little bit more uh, factual basis, nearly 15,000 nuclear weapons, most in order of magnitude more powerful than the US atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over 90% held by the United States and Russia continue to pose an intolerable threat to humanity in the biosphere. And then a recognition that no national or international response capacity exists that would adequately respond to the human suffering and humanitarian harm that would result from a nuclear weapon explosion in a populated area and will probably never exist. And that the United States and all of the other nuclear armed states are engaged in programs to modernize the bombs, warheads, and delivery systems, uh, including in some cases giving them vastly improved targeting capability. So the next slide very important on this 50th anniversary of King's Beyond Vietnam speech, the resolution recalls King's quote, that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense and on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. So next slide, um, we haven't talked about nuclear weapons spending yet, so let me just tell you we're talking about a lot of money. President Trump entered office with the United States poised to spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years to maintain and modernize its nuclear bombs and warheads, the submarines, missiles, and bombers to deliver them, and the infrastructure to sustain the nuclear enterprise indefinitely. And the second point, I'll just summarize to say that the request for just the warheads, not including delivery percent of systems, is 10.8% higher than the fiscal year 2017 level. Can you move to the next slide, please? Okay, so this one, I, I won't read it at all. You can read it yourself, but calling on the US government as an urgent priority to do everything that's power to low, lower nuclear tensions, to intense diplomatic efforts. This is in spite of the Russia Gate controversy. Um, and then welcoming the historic negotiations, which actually were just completed at the United Nations uh, on a treaty to prohibit the threat for use of nuclear weapons, the possession, development, maintenance of nuclear weapons, which was adopted by 122 countries, and deeply regretting that the US and the other nuclear armed states boycotted the negotiations, and then calling on the US to support the ban treaty negotiations as a major step towards negotiation of comprehensive agreement on the achievement of per permanent maintenance of a world free of nuclear weapons. Next slide, this is the one that we've all been waiting for. So here's the money paragraph, and this wraps, up, wraps back to the other resolutions, calls on the President and Congress to reverse federal spending priorities and to redirect funds currently allocated to nuclear weapons and unwarranted military spending to restore full funding for community block development grants and the Environmental Protection Agency to create jobs by rebuilding our nation's crumbling infrastructure and to ensure basic human services for all including education, environmental protection, food assistance, housing, and health care, and then calling on 
uh, U.S. Mem mayors to join Mayors for Peace and to take action. Okay. The next one. Next slide. So the, the Mayors for Peace resolution also welcomes the resolutions adopted by the cities that I mentioned earlier. And it also unanimously adopted two complementary resolutions, opposition to military spending, sponsored by the Mayor of Ithaca, New York, and calling for hearings on real city budgets needed and the taxes our cities send to the federal military budget sponsored by the Mayor of New Haven. So I have a few more things to say. I realize I'm running a little bit late here, but let me just try to talk about how we can use these resolutions at the local level. Go to the next slide. If people want to write down the, uh, the link, you can read the resolution. I only I barely scratched the surface of it. So first, the Mayor's for Peace resolution is designed to be used as an educational tool. So please use it. Give it to your mayor, your congressional representatives, and your local media. Publish it on your website. Use it as a basis for op-eds. Ask your mayor to use it as a basis for town hall meetings. Uh, find out if your mayor is a member of Mayors for Peace, and if not, sign him or her up. That's very easy, www.mayorsforpeace.org. Work with your city council to adopt resolutions modeled on the recent local city resolutions or draft one commending and affirming the U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution, and I can help with that. Another important thing mayors can do is to raise public awareness about how military spending is diverting resources badly needed to address the needs of cities and about the growing dangers and costs of nuclear weapons. One way to do this is to host relevant art exhibits in city halls and other public spaces, and I can help with some connections there. And then I want to talk about briefly about divestment. Um, in its 2016 resolution, the U.S. Conference of Mayors commanded um, the mayor of Cambridge and the Cambridge City Council for voting to divest their $1 billion city pension fund from all companies involved in production of nuclear weapons and entities involved in such companies. Subsequently, the Future of Life Institute at MIT, which had worked with Cambridge on its divestment plan, prepared a nuclear weapons divestment toolkit for cities, which we distributed at the June U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting. It's not available online yet, but I can provide you with print copies. Regarding divestment, it bears more thought because we certainly don't want to be divesting from nuclear weapons and reinvesting in fossil fuels. So that presents challenges and opportunities, but it offers us an opportunity to make common cause with other issue constituencies, such as fossil fuel and pipeline opponents. And in order to build the strong grassroots movement we need from the bottom up, we have to find ways to get out of our issue silos and organize across issues. Now, how to organize at the city level. In many ways, it's similar to lobbying Congress, which is what we're gonna hear about next. But it does depend in large part on the size of your city. In small to medium cities, you can probably request and get a meeting with your mayor or council members. In large cities, you'll need to cultivate relationships with their key staff people. And you might even want to initiate a local petition campaign to uh, ensure your access. Um, one useful tip is that it's helpful to know what the issues of concern are to cities in general and to your city in particular, and you can learn a lot by looking at the U.S. Conference of Mayors website, for example, to learn about community block development grants, which Bill mentioned, which are really important to cities. Finally, it's always helpful to work with people engaged in other issues who may be able to make introductions for you. For example, when recently trying to reach my own mayor to ask her to co-sponsor the recent U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution, I was having no luck getting her to respond. I reached out to colleagues who were working on climate change, and sure enough, one of them was able to contact the staff right away, a staff person right away, based on their previous interactions, and we got the mayor's endorsement right away. So um, again, I, I would be happy to uh, consult and work with you on developing a Real Cities campaign. Um, in September, <laughs> and my contact information is at that link there, so thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, thank you also for your wisdom and knowledge and all the work that you've done. And um, yeah, just to let know people that will be sending the, the webinar recording and the slides, if you have RSVP at um, hopepink.org, slash no 54 billion webinar two. So if you are the key to um, on our website, then you'll receive all the materials and also we'll send um, some contact information so that you can um, ask 
questions, more questions for uh, Jackie and Bill. And, um, and yeah, as, as Bill and Jackie have mentioned, there's, you know, tools that you can use to start organizing locally. And now we have the opportunity to lobby Congress and hopefully make some change for September. But um, organizing locally will stay. Um, building coalitions will be very important to show the intersections of all the problems that we're facing right now. So now um, I'm going to pass it to Ariel from Code Pink, who's going to talk a little bit more about the opportunity we have now to lobby Congress and how to do that. Hi, so uh, I want to reiterate that um, this, this budget has not passed yet and that our Congress is accountable to, its, to us, to constituents. And so we have an opportunity here to oppose this budget. Uh, starting next week, next Monday, uh, Congress will be on recess. And so in home districts, that means that you have uh, a couple of ways to address your representatives in Congress. You can go to town halls and you can also request meetings uh, with your Congress members or with their staff. Um, the way to request a meeting would be to go to uh, their website and find the contact information. You would then send an email uh, letting them know that you're, you're a constituent and you would like to request a meeting with them and that you'd like to discuss uh, the proposed budget and specifically the amount of money uh, that's proposed to go towards military spending. We know quite well that Congress is most responsive to in-person uh, visits. It's fantastic as well to email uh, your representatives and to make phone calls. And um, as we get closer to September, we will be asking uh, people to do that to Congress. But we also know that in-person, face-to-face, really has one of the largest impacts um, uh, on how Congress votes. And so this is a great opportunity to meet with them in person. Um, and, you know, to, to really make, you know, your voice heard. And in this case, we're, we're very clearly asking them to vote no um, on the budget. And through that, we're hoping both to stall the budget and to reduce uh, the amount of money that is allocated uh, towards military spending. Uh, so I think that's it for me um, on that. Um, I'll pass it back to Mariana, and we're probably going to ask for, uh, open it up for questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah, so now, um we're going to open some time and space for questions. So there's a couple of ways you can ask your questions. You, I'm going to unmute everyone. And um, this way you can just maybe um, get on stack or something. Or you can also write your, if you're joining us through the, the Zoom uh, conference call, then you can just write your question in the chat box and I can um, read your question. So I'll go ahead and unmute everyone. If you have questions for Bill, if you have questions for Yaki, well. this is a really good time. This is Tony Ludwinko. Um, go ahead, Tony. Karen Bass is my uh, congressperson. She's pretty receptive to um, the arguments against the budget, and she's consistently voted against the Trump program. But it seems like um, we're really preaching to the choir unless we put the the hard pressure on Congress people in marginal districts 
which could go either way. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, if, if that is part of the targeted, uh, targeted um, uh, approach which is being taken. I mean, I'm in liberal California. I mean, it's, it's not probably going to make any difference to me, particularly in Karen Bass's district. There might be some people who are worried about uh, re-election uh, in California who might make a difference. There's some Republicans who are under pressure. But uh, I, it seems to me that the real, the real problem appears to be in those marginal districts in which you've got a real chance to uh, bring some pressure on a uh, congressperson who is going to vote against the budget. That's all. Thank you for your question, Tony. Um, anyone want to answer Tony's question? Um, I can take that. So, you know, we're, we're looking for a momentum here. We would love to have, you know, a champion in Congress, some of those marginal members to oppose the budget. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we build that momentum by getting members of Congress to speak out more against the budget. You know, it was quite shocking to have Trump already proposing uh, 54 billion and then having the Senate and the House say that itself was not enough. And right. so, yeah, so we need all opposition uh, to the budget. And I think some of the ways that we sometimes see momentum in Congress is, you know, it can gather from any, any, you know, from all directions at the same time. So I, I would say it's, it's always important, even if you're in a very progressive area and um, your member of Congress is likely to vote against the budget, still to meet with them, to advocate, uh, to oppose the budget, to become a city for peace, um, pass a city resolution, all of that is part of the momentum that we need. Okay. Let me add something. Um, I mean, I think one of the challenges we face is to cross the bridge <laughs> to, to meet halfway with the people who are going to be most directly, who are being most directly impacted. And it's been hard to do. There's still a lot of resistance to taking on militarism. And one of the modest, more successful efforts, I think, has been led by the Coalition on Human Needs, which I draw your attention to, which is a, a, a national organization that is coming from the other side, but which has put together several very strong letters to Congress and gotten signatures from something like 1,500 organizations. Um, and they, they don't really go into military spending in depth, but they do identify it right up front as a source of funding to meet human needs. So I think we need to be a lot more, um, we need to put a lot more thought and creativity in how to make common cause with, with, with those folks who should be on our side. But again, I want to mention, I, I glossed over this, we, we are up against a, a system that is embedded all over the country. And so we talk a lot about foreign bases in the peace movement. We don't talk much about the domestic bases. I think there are 6,000 of them in the United States. Um, and also all of the military military contractors. And as you probably know, just about every weapon system um, that is um, authorized and, and, and paid for is divided up into like 38 different pieces that are produced in 38 different states. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's really, it's, I mean, Bill can elaborate on this very well, but, you know, we have to be strategic and, and, and really try to think about new ways to, to address these challenges. Stop. 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 So, um, it's ready for the next question. Uh, sure, I'll just read one comment from Michael in Oakland. Um, it says, even some of the most progressive members of Congress, like Barbara Lee, have brought into the Cold War Russia bashing that works at cross purposes to their stated objective of moving away from military confrontationalism to yeah. diplomatic resolution of international disputes. So meetings with even the best MOC are even worthwhile if you want to contradictory behavior. Thank you, Michael. Um, who had another question? 
I did. This is David. Hi, David. Hi. When the uh, presentation came up regarding contacting our uh, Congress members, um, the comment was made that uh, the Congress members are accountable to the constituents. And, um, it, it seems as though that's primarily only true at, at election time. And um, otherwise, it's, we don't quite get the attention that I think uh, we would deserve. But election time, they definitely pay attention. Um, and then you would propose contacting them in person is always best, but also emails and phone calls. And my question was, I was wondering, can Code Pink as an organization do pledges at election time? Because um, at election time, they're really busy. Even those that are in, you know, uh, more progressive districts, they're still active. They're meeting with constituents. They're attending events, and um, that's a great opportunity to get them to commit to, you know, less spending on nukes or finding ways to, you know, move towards a peace economy. And really, you know, it puts them on the spot. Um, it's election time. They're meeting with lots of constituents. They get in the news cycle and it seems like a huge opportunity to me to get their commitment and get their signature when they're meeting with constituents and when they know that, you know, if they don't, then it's a great opportunity to go ask their challengers if they'd like to sign the petition, especially in the primary season um, in, in, in spring next year. What do you think? Uh, I'll respond to that. So sure, you know, I think that uh, election time is definitely when uh, Congress pays the most attention and is the most accountable. However, members of Congress are always thinking of their reelection bids um, at all times. So this is part of, you know, what happens when they're in home districts is they are thinking ahead uh, towards election time and and this is always you know a question to them of how how do you represent me um, I think election bids are a great idea and that's something that uh, we can look into and what about the pledges can we actually you know bring to them any the same as any other petition that we're signing ourselves and forwarding to them ask them to pledge to take action specifically on the action that we'd like done um, I think that's definitely a possibility that, that we can look into is, is pledges for them. I know a few years back, Amnesty International did it big time. They hit every single congressional office and the impact was fantastic. Um, they either signed and they didn't, and then they published the results. And those that didn't sign were really embarrassed to not join the pledge. It was, uh, should we put a blo naval blockade around Iran or not? And uh, those that didn't sign were hugely embarrassed. Yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. It sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, David. And yeah, we're um, always looking for new ideas and creative ideas to target our representatives. So please also, if you have other ideas, keep emailing us or contacting us. Um, are there any other questions or comments? What's your name that's on Jody Evans' screen? Oh, this is Mariana Mendoza. Hi, Mariana. I think as well. <laughs> so there's another um, question in the chat box. It's from, I think, Robin. Um, it says, I attended the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability session in Washington, D.C. in May. A staffer in Bernie's office said that highly radioactive nuclear waste will be transported from Chalk Reef, Canada to Savannah River, possibility through our Highway 89. How can we find more information about this transportation of nuclear waste? Anybody has the answer for that? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking up a website right now. Yeah, Robin, if you Talk to the New Mexico-based ANA groups. They'll have the information. Uh, yeah, Nuke Watch New Mexico. It's, yeah. If you just Google it, you'll get them. But they're, um, they're on top of that kind of stuff. Wow, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? There's Tony Kenya. 
uh, Michael in Oakland is saying um, that Robin can make a request to your member of, of Congress and, and a FOIA request to the Department of Energy. Um, I don't know if I can speak, if I'm in a queue. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, this is Paula. Hi, Paula. Hi. Um, one way I'm thinking and reading the narrative, if we start sending postcards to our Congress people saying, I want my, I want the $30 billion to be spent on such and such, or I want 54% of my taxes to be spent on such and such. So we're talking less in the know and more in, this is what I want. Since we seem to have all this extra money to spend, this is what I would like it to be spent on. Thank you, Paola. That's a really good question. So I want to encourage people to go to the National Priorities website. And they have a, a tool that you can use to look at trade-offs in your own specific community and how that money is being spent and how you want it to be spent. And this is a, a great tool in preparation uh, for meeting with your representatives in Congress. And that's a national priorities website. I can put the link in the chat box. Thank you, Muriel. Anybody else would like to respond to that question? Ask your question. I, I, a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, we had, we, we, there was an attempt to have a, uh, what did we call it, new priorities network, where we were discussing these exact things before the crisis was so obviously critical. And it was, it was very difficult. It didn't catch on the way we had hoped it would, but there were some town hall meetings with members of Congress where a really serious attempt was made to bring get people in the community to testify about their personal situations and how they were being impacted by federal budget cuts, federal budget priorities. Um, and it seems to me that uh, that's an important part of really getting buy-in from the local community because sometimes the, the military questions are, are, seem abstract. Uh, whereas if a person's um, food stamps are being cut, that's very concrete. So, I, but I would like, the, again, it, the way this happened, it all got completely pulled out of the, you know, out of the context of military spending. And so if we were to do that, go that route again, I would want to work really hard to make a, a, a real connection so that people there could understand what was happening. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, I also um, encourage you to go to National Priorities website, project's website, because there, there you can see how much uh, money could be invested in projects like healthcare or other services that are needed. And you can uh, as well use that data to advocate um, for those services in, in your community. Are there any other questions or comments? There was a note on the chat about whether I had a PowerPoint of my talk. I'm gonna write it up on Medium and I'll, you know, as a short piece and I'll send a link that can go out to folks. Excellent. Wonderful, thank you, Bill. And again, we'll be sending the recording of the webinar and also the PowerPoint slides. Um, other questions or comments? Let's get to work. Let's get to work. <laughs> Let's get to work. That's right, Tony. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, as all the speakers said, you know, it's crucial that we um, that we make our voice heard yeah. uh, for our community and um, are able or 
um, take advantage of all the tools and knowledge that is out there to advocate for our rights and also you know create the spaces to imagine what could be possible because sometimes we're all just reacting to to the horrible things that is that are happening um, but it's also important that we think about what do we want and what do we need in our communities and how do we imagine a world without war and violence so um, thank you again and uh, hopefully we'll keep creating um, spaces like these to share more knowledge and um, and bring questions and ideas to collectively create um, a better world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 We're going to, that, that was a, live chat from people all over the country that I just participated in. You know.